I would say in one word, hybridity. I was a hybrid child. My dad uh, was a Greek who came to study in France and stayed. Uh, and my mom is uh, French and German. Um, so with my name, I can't hide my Greek origins. And in school or at growing up, I was always this kind of strange Greek person with this weird name and boys would attack me on my name and I would punch them in the face and say, well, I'm proud to be Greek. But um, in France, I was not really French and in Greece, I wasn't really Greek. Um, so I was brought up in this in-betweenness and yet proud of, my, of these two roots. And at the same time, by a mother who conveyed very early on to me and my brother the fact that Europe saved her because mm -hmm. she was a child of World War II as a French German. She had one of the most horrible wars of anyone being deported to Germany as a kid who, and who had to take care of her family because there were lots of things going on. A father a resistant against Hitler uh, who um, but led the kids and the wife in very crazy circumstances. And when she came back to France in 1945 from Germany, having been deported, people would ask her, where are you from? And she would say, I'm European. <laughs> Way before any of what we're talking about even existed. And she taught me this, I am European. And yet I took this in, Europe as survival, Europe as the idea that saves you from despair, because she was a very desperate little girl. And, but yet I didn't have any of this sorrow and suffering. It's a lucky generation. And so for me, Europe was both the story of my mother and my vécu, my experience of hybridity. Um, and indeed that experience of hybridity translated it very early into transnational politics. Because in, in the late 60s, I was born in 62, in 68, when the Greek dictatorship starts, 67, 68, my dad would send me and my parents, you know, even in May 68, to distribute leaflets against the Greek dictatorship. And I was this cute little six years old, so nobody would say no to me. And I had to explain then and again and again and again what was happening in Greece to French, to other people. So I experienced very early the idea that politics somewhere else matters where you are and that you need to speak to people around you and that is Europe. Europe mm -hmm. is about resisting together and being mm -hmm. together in fighting for freedom and I know it sounds grand and a bit funny but I was a little girl and I understood that because of circumstance. Well that's a difficult story because you know if you are raised in the 70s in high school, you know, politics very domestic or global. That is, the in-between of Europe was not very present. I was a very political kid in human rights and the Socialist International. But the intermediary Europe was not that important because after all, if we all recall, and as you all learn and we all learn at school, you know, Europe in the 70s, Eurosclerosis was kind of either not going well at all or boring technical standards about the height of lights behind trucks and things, you know, who cares? So the European project for me was an idea about, you know, culture, history, wars, reconciliation, Franco-German in, in our case, Greek-German, uh, these bilateral relations, you know, it was an idea, but the European community, or the, which became the European Union, only came to figure in my life in the 80s, as I was a student both at Sciences Po and then later at Harvard, and I did a master thesis on, um, I was in political economy, so single market, the global, is can Europe be a model? And little by little, uh, it became part of my life, including for me, the Big Bang was the single act and the single market. It, so between 85 and the late 80s, when I was starting to do a PhD at Harvard and working on this and being part of groups, and that was our big thing, and I interviewed loads of people. Uh, but I was still always active globally. I was working at UNCTAD at the time for developing countries and asking what does Europe do or can Europe do 
for more global justice. So I was kind of always interested in how the European IDEA project, concrete developments like the Single Act connected the global agenda. I've never left that. Perhaps, I mean, with hindsight, you know, we always ask, why do, we, why do I think like this from my own life in a way that you're asking me? And sometimes you're not that aware of the connection as you evolve, but looking back. And looking back, I remember that although I was interested in general and political economy and all of those things, what really struck me and fascinated me right away when I studied the single market and ended up being my PhD thesis at Harvard was the idea of mutual recognition. And looking back, and this was mutual recognition of regulation, a rather technical thing, but I was fascinated by this because in a way, what I had experienced since my youth is that Europe, in fact the world, is all about these bilateral and mutual relations between people or groups that do recognize or fail to recognize each other in the deep meaning of empathy and taking in the other, but also non-interference. I accept you as you are and yet I understand you. Maybe I want to change you a bit. And it's this complex story of mutual recognition that for me has been the thread from my childhood as an intuition to my PhD, which was technical, all the way to today when I think part of what's happened with the Euro crisis is in a way a failure to sustain the spirit of mutual recognition mm -hmm. in Europe. And indeed I wrote a little book about this called The Greco-German Affair in the Euro Crisis, Mutual Recognition Laws with Kira and Claudia, two wonderful friends and colleagues. Um, but we asked this for, French and, for Greece and Germany in the context of the Euro crisis because there you had ascription, you had insults, you had prejudice, and yet at the same time, because of all this tension, which is always underpinned by money, how much are you going to ask me to give you? Do you want me to give you my credit card and the passcode and do whatever you want with mm -hmm. it? The Germans asked the Greeks. And in doing so, they deny the dignity and the respect and the reality of what Greece mm -hmm. is. And then the Greeks throw back, you're just miserly dictators and whatever, and they deny the complexity of each other. And yet, as peoples insult each other in a Euro crisis, they also get to know each other. You know yeah. how it is. Well, yeah. I don't know if you're married yet, but you know. <laughs> when you have a fight, you know, you say the truth. Um, so, um, so that for me has been the, the thread, I think, if I try to find a thread, about my understanding of what Europe should be all about, has been in part all about mutual recognition between peoples and yet is in danger of losing, but I hope hasn't quite lost and will recover. Now you ask me how it connects to other people's agenda. And it's funny because we tend to, as we get older, uh, tend to be more imperialist in some ways about our research or our thinking. Uh, and in a way you, you kind of see what other people do and think, you see, but you, there's mutual recognition in there. Now, of course, you know, the field of European studies has exploded from the very, from, from a center ground where it was kind of political science, let's understand and analyze patterns in two directions. That's kind of stayed at the core with all sorts of debates where you have new versions of the old debates. You had institutionalism, inter intergovernmentalism. Now you have the new, new and the new, new, new and all of these debates, which is all usually about what is the driving force for what's happening in Europe. Um, and then, it goes both in the direction of positivist, quantitative uh, and anal analysis on one hand and normative, narrative analysis on the other. And part of the, for me, the challenge of the field in understanding Europe is that we have to kind of connect, if not bring together, these are different culture, methodologies, fields, disciplines, sensitivities, and even beliefs as to what matters in Europe. But sometimes it's driven by what theory and method you kind of want to apply. But we need to connect them better. And I, for one, I'm not wielded to any method or any theory. I try to ask questions about the world and address them as best I can. Um, and so I continue to try to find translations. And my commitment is translation. 
translation between all these different disciplines and ways of seeing Europe or international relations for that matter, my field. Also translation very, very importantly between countries and national cultures and languages, literally language, not just Italian, Spanish, French, English, German, da da da, but the language and the whole culture that goes around it, a legal language, or whatever, a German legal language, a French legal German. So languages, and the third translation is obviously very, very important, is between what we do here as scholars in Oxford, you do um, in your studies, and the world of policy, the world of action, the world of doing. And I've always been committed to that third translation, spending a lot of time in Brussels, pretending for a number of years to be a wise man. Uh, and that is very important. Many of my fellow scholars do very relevant studies where you can see what matters, you can see what is suboptimal, whether or not the policy world is ready to receive those insights is a different question and something we need to be working very hard about because mm -hmm. we as academics, we are held accountable when we receive funding or whatever for having impact, for speaking to the world. But then I ask Marina, do we think that at the Commission, in the Council, in in the embassies, do they feel responsible for the taxpayer money they've given us? Do they feel responsible for listening to mm -hmm. us? Um, I'm not sure. The EU institutions, the EU Commission gives us millions, H2020, networks, etc., all this funding. Do they really pay attention at the end of the day to the findings? Are they committed to justifying whether they've listened, whether they apply something, why they don't apply something? I think that's a huge agenda. So this third translation is just not one way. You know, we scholars speak to the policy world. But the policy world needs to also have a commitment and a responsibility to listen. So that's also part of my agenda.